Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana University College of Arts and Sciences, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Vanessa Klo, and I serve as the college's Director of Alumni Relations. Our Food for Thought live streaming series serves as an opportunity for alumni and friends to hear from faculty experts, explore topics of interest, and stay connected with IU and the College of Arts and Sciences, regardless of your location. On April 8th, 2024, North America will experience a total solar eclipse, which will pass over numerous states and countless locations, including the Indiana University campuses in Bloomington, Indianapolis, Kokomo, Richmond, and Columbus, Indiana. In collaboration with the IU Alumni Association and Arbutus Society at the Indiana University Foundation, we are delighted to bring you a special six-part series about this astronomical phenomenon. Tonight's presentation will offer insights into what communities in the path of totality can anticipate during this rare celestial event. At this time, I'm delighted to introduce this evening's featured presenter, Distinguished Professor and Daniel Kirkwood Chair of Astronomy, Katie Pilachowski. Professor Pilachowski is an observational astronomer who uses large telescopes in Hawaii, Arizona, Chile to study the chemical evolution of stars. Specifically, her research focuses on how the compositions of diverse populations of stars differ from each other due to the varying histories of star formation. Before joining the IU faculty, Professor Pilachowski worked at the National Observatory in Tucson, where she helped build the 3.5 meter wind telescope that IU astronomers use for their research. Following her talk, Professor Pilachowski will be joined by Professor Emeritus of Physics, Tim Londrigan for the audience Q&A session. An award-winning teacher, Prof Professor Londrigan was a principal investigator or co-PI on 15 grants from the National Science Foundation over a 45 year period. He served in several administrative roles, including chair of the Department of Physics and director of the Wells, Scholar, Wells Scholars Program here in Bloomington. In his retirement, Professor Londrigan co-authors the blog, Debunking Denial, which contrasts skepticism and denial on issues of science and public policy. You can submit your questions at any point during this evening's discussion. Simply click on the Q&A tab located in your webinar toolbar. Hover your mouse over your screen and your toolbar should appear. Closed captioning is also available. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Pilachowski for her presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Vanessa. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. Good. So welcome to everybody. Thank you for being here. I want to uh, discuss tonight the the total solar eclipse that we'll be enjoying here in Bloomington in what, just a few weeks at this point. Um, I wanna start by sort of talking a little bit about what we'll see. So there are basically three types of eclipses, the partial eclipse, which is what we saw here in Bloomington in 2017, where the sun was 94% covered by the moon, but still not totally covered. Last October, we had an annular eclipse that swept through the Western part of the US, uh, down through Texas, uh, but it was partial here in Bloomington. An annular eclipse means that the moon was too small to completely cover the sun. And so we saw a ring of fire around the outside. We didn't see it, but in Texas and the West, they did. But the, the 2024 eclipse that we'll see in a few weeks will be total here in Bloomington and on a path all the way from Texas up through Maine. For those of us lucky enough to be on the path of totality, we will see the sun completely blocked by the moon. I always like to talk to start a talk by giving this important warning about eye safety. And that is, please never look directly at the sun. Any time during the partial phases of the eclipse or any solar eclipse that's not total, users, watchers, viewers must use some kind of eye protection, either indirect viewing devices or viewers like these eclipse glasses, various things that allow us to look at the, at the sun safely. Um, any kind of direct looking at the sun can in fact produce significant eye damage and which could be permanent. So please, please, please be careful about that. But don't miss totality. If you have any chance of seeing it, please do your very best. Uh, a total eclipse is a very rare thing. And I love this XKCD cartoon uh, that, that shows us how cool something is to see in person 
compared to how cool it sounds like it will be. And a total eclipse of the sun is completely off the chart. It is the most amazing experience I've ever had. And I think a lot of people share that opinion. During totality, when the moon completely covers the sun, take away the viewer and just look, and you'll see just the most amazing sight in the sky. So this path of totality will pass from Texas up through Maine, across Indiana, and states in between. The total time of the eclipse will be about an hour, starting from the, the, the period of totality will start in Texas, last just a few minutes, and go all the way up through Maine, and that, that time of coverage of the eclipse across the U.S. will last about an hour. At any given spot, totality is about four minutes. So just a short part of that time, that eclipse passes all the way across this part of the country. You'll notice the color shading on this particular uh, plot, which indicates basically the probability of clear weather. So here in Bloomington, we have about a 40% chance of clear weather. The further south we go, the better chance we have of clear weather during, uh, during the eclipse. So we're kind of at a midpoint here. Bloomington is in a lucky little uh, lighter yellow spot, not that orangey area. So I'm hopeful that we'll have really good weather here in Bloomington for the eclipse. But if you're planning travel, uh, Bloomington is a great spot to look, but Texas is better, I have to admit. So save the date, Monday, April 8th, 2024. We are near the center of the path of totality, and here the uh, totality will last about four minutes and two seconds. It begins, the partial eclipse begins just before two o'clock. Totality at midpoint is just after three o'clock, and then the the last bit of the sun will become uncovered by the moon at about 20 minutes past four. So it's a long period of time, but that short period of totality is what is the most important for everybody. One of the reasons that Bloomington is such a great spot to watch the eclipse, aside from just being a great spot anyway all the time, is that we are so very close to the center of the path of totality. This particular uh, map of Indiana shows the duration of the period of totality for different regions um, around in, uh, in the path of totality. So in Indianapolis, for example, it's just a bit between, well, just under, um, just a bit longer than three minutes and 30 seconds. Um, Martinsville, Bloomington are all very near the very center of the path of totality and will have the longest duration of totality of anywhere in the state. The eclipse will pass down near Vincennes up through uh, Richmond in that area, but encompassing very much a large part of the state. Uh, so I, I think we're going to get a lot of traffic coming up from New Albany and, and Louisville um, into Bloomington. Um, and we're looking forward to a lot of visitors here in Bloomington during the totality of the eclipse. So one of the things that I get asked a lot, an awful lot is how um, often do eclipses occur? So about uh, two and a half per year occur somewhere on the Earth. That includes both total and partial eclipses. We get a total eclipse somewhere on the Earth about once every 18 months on average. Any given spot on Earth, we'll see an, an eclipse about once every 375 years. Bloomington has been fairly lucky. We had one just uh, 150 or so years ago in 1869. Uh, so we've seen, this is our second in less than 200 years. So we've been very fortunate to see uh, these eclipses. Eclipses occur when the moon passes directly between the earth and the sun. And what we have is the shadow of the moon that passes, uh, swings across the earth as the moon uh, moves along its orbit from one side of the sun to the other. Uh, if we're lucky, we're, we're on that path of totality and we see a total eclipse. If we're not so lucky, we might see a partial eclipse if we happen to be a fairly, uh, in geographically not too far away from, from where that totality occurs. The moon's shadow is fairly small, so it, it uh, covers just a very small spot on the Earth of totality. When the moon swings around to the other side of its orbit, we get a lunar eclipse. And because the Earth is so much larger, um, it the moon fully fits within the Earth, and everyone on the night side of the Earth can see the lunar eclipse. But a total eclipse on any given spot on Earth is extremely rare. Uh, just to put everybody on the same page about scale, we can think of the moon, uh, its relative size is about the size of a tennis ball. The Earth has a diameter about four, four times the size of a tennis ball, so roughly the size of a basketball. And the sun's uh, size is more like the size of a basketball court. On this scale, and you see how, how different these sizes are, 
On this scale, the moon is about 30 times the Earth diameter away. So if we put that tennis ball about uh, 30 feet from the Earth, that's about the relative scale and distance of Earth and moon. And on that scale, the sun is about two miles away. So things are really far apart. And that's why the moon's shadow is so small and occupies uh, a very small piece um, of, on the Earth's surface. And one of the questions that often comes up is the alignment, how alignment is so critical in whether we see a total eclipse or not. The moon's orbit is tilted by about five degrees to the Earth's equator. And that means that most of the time when the a moon passes between the Earth and the sun, its shadow falls above or below the Earth itself. And in those cases, we don't see even a partial eclipse. We're simply not able to see any of the moon blocking the sun. The moon is higher or lower than the moon in the, than the sun in the sky, and so we don't see a total eclipse. And that's why they're so very rare. The other thing that happens is that the distance of the moon from the Earth uh, changes uh, as around its orbit. Sometimes it's a little bit closer. Those are times when, when that happens during a full moon, we get a supermoon. Other times the moon is a little bit further away. And in those cases, the moon appears smaller in the sky. If a total eclipse occurs when the moon is a little further from the Earth, we see an annular eclipse because the moon is not in projection is not large enough to fully cover the sun. And so the sun has a ring of fire. We see a ring of fire around the moon when it, the moon is a little further away. This particular image shows how lucky we are to be here right at this time. This is a map of eclipses in the US between 2001 and 2050. Uh, we have, uh, have had a, a nice run of eclipses in the last uh, 10 years or so. There was uh, or a couple of annular eclipses. Those are the, the yellow ones on this chart and some those blue ones. Uh, one in 2017 that I hope many of you were able to see that ran from Oregon across the US, across uh, parts of Kentucky, Tennessee, and down into South Carolina. Uh, that one was pretty wonderful to see, and I hope many of you got to. And we have an eclipse uh, this year, April 8th, 2024, that runs that, that blue line from Texas up through Maine. We aren't going to see much else until the 2040s. And in that time, again, the U.S. will be in a position uh, during these, these uh, new moon times to see a, a number of additional eclipses. So this is the lucky time to see these particular this particular eclipse. And we're so lucky. Oh, I wanted to point out one more thing. You notice that the path for the 2017 eclipse was pretty thin. Pretty, pretty narrow, running from Oregon through um, through South Carolina. And the path uh, for our April eclipse this year that runs from Texas up through Maine is wider. And that is a clue that we have a longer period of totality this time than they did in 2017. In 2017, totality lasted about two minutes, but it's wider this time. And that means we have a longer period of totality. So we will see it a little over four minutes here in Bloomington. So when this eclipse begins, it's pretty exciting. We see that first little sliver of the moon beginning to cross the sun. That we call first contact when the moon just begins to contact the sun in the sky. Uh, at this point, you must use viewing devices in order to look at the sun. Uh, you, of course, we don't look at the sun. Uh, it's just not a good thing. Excitement begins. We begin to say, oh, look, it's happening. There's an eclipse. It's coming. It's going to happen. We're going to see it. And then it's a long period of waiting. It seems to take forever for that moon to, to actually cross the sun and to cover it completely. The moon crosses apparently seemingly just really slowly as it covers more and more of the sun's disk. But we begin to see things happening in the environment around us. We can watch the shadows under the trees. If you live in a, a region where the trees are in bloom, uh, you'll see little images of the eclipse on the ground below the trees where light sort of peaks between the leaves. We can begin to look for changes in the color and brightness of the sky and begin to look for changes in local weather. I'll show you some of those specific examples. When the moon gets about halfway across, the excitement begins to build again. We're getting closer and closer and closer to totality, but it still seems to take forever. But those effects we see on the ground begin to uh, be a little bit more apparent. As totality approaches, a number of really interesting things begin to happen. Shadows get sharper. Uh, the temperature likely will cool off uh, anywhere from a few degrees to even as much as 20 degrees. Winds may change direction or winds may uh, build up. Uh, we will begin to see clouds on the southwestern horizon beginning to darken. 
and we might, if we're lucky, see these faint ripples of light and dark on the ground called shadow beds, and I'll show you more about each of these effects. The shadows are the amazing thing, um, particularly as we get near the uh, near the time when the moon is completely, not quite, but almost completely covering the sun. So normally the shadows appear as we see in this image on the left here. They're kind of fuzzy. And that's because the moon has a diameter and of the sun has a diameter of about half a degree. And that means that we, the edges of our shadows become blurry. But as we approach totality, we're seeing, we have just a crescent moon, just a very narrow sliver of the moon uh, producing the shadows and the shadows become much, much sharper on the ground uh, below us or any shadows that we, that we see. So those can become very, very sharp in particular right before totality. And it's an interesting thing to watch for as we wait for that to totality period to begin. If we have trees out with leaves in them, they make little pinhole cameras. And each of those little beams of light that pass between the leaves of the tree will produce uh, an image of the sun in the partial eclipse phases. So if you have trees out and if they have leaves, uh, look for this sort of effect on the ground, particularly as we approach uh, totality. It's a wonderful sight to see, and it, it's an easy way to watch the eclipse uh, proceed uh, without having to use those viewers all the time to watch the sun. A number of other simple ways to see the partial phase if you don't happen to have a viewer. First of all, you can try some eclipse art. This image of, of uh, the Egyptian here is just a piece of paper with a lot of little holes punched in it. If it's held up to the sun on the ground below, you can see the images of the partially eclipsed sun, uh, multiple images uh, produced by the holes in a piece of paper, or even just your fist, making a small hole uh, between your fingers uh, will produce an image on the ground of the partially eclipsed sun, as you can see here in this image. And notice the shadow of the person there, uh, how, how fine detail you can see even the hair on individual hairs on the head. Um, so these shadows get very, very sharp as we get very close to totality. Back in 2017, down in, in Knoxville or Hopkinsville, Kentucky, uh, there was a, a weather report monitoring the temperature during totality. This was a totality of only two minutes, but you can see as the eclipse proceeds from first contact, as the sun um, is covered by the moon, how the temperature dropped uh, relatively quickly dropped a total of about four degrees. This was in August um, and it, it cooled off somewhat and then uh, continued to be fairly cool because the moon is still partially covering the sun after totality. And then the temperature built up again through the rest of the afternoon. We have found some places occasionally we'll see temperature drops as much as 20 degrees. Uh, and I don't know how to predict what it might be in Bloomington. That's gonna depend on local conditions. What is the wind like? Is it cloudy? How cloudy is it? What is the humidity? All of those things will affect the amount of temperature drop uh, during the eclipse. But we certainly can expect to see some temperature drop during the eclipse. As we get really close to totality, we can witness another effect that is difficult to take a photograph of. Uh, when we have just a crescent of sunlight, be sure to look around. Uh, colors become unusual, a little bit odd. Things don't look right. It's just kind of an eerie light that we see at that time. The colors seem a little more saturated. Uh, shadows are very stark. Contrast seems to be boosted. As I say, it's just hard to capture with a camera, but we can explain why it happens. And this is an effect called limb darkening on the sun. So we see the same effect on the earth. When you look out on a sunny day, the sky is blue up above, but as you look toward the horizon, it looks less and less blue, more of a whitish color. On the sun, we see a similar effect. When we look directly at the center of the sun, we're seeing through a thin layer of the sun's atmosphere. But as we look around at the edge of the sun, we're looking through a larger amount of the sun's atmosphere. And the sun appears a little bit darker because the light is going through more atmosphere. And we're seeing a slightly cooler region of the sun. So it looks a little bit more reddish. So when we see a partial phase of the eclipse, a crescent, we're seeing really just that light from the edge of the sun. So we're getting light that is a different color balance than we would normally see. And that's part of the reason it looks so peculiar. These shadow bands are also very hard to photograph. In this particular image, you might notice some diagonal uh, from upper left to lower right, sort of shadowy, dark, darker sh uh, streaks across this picture of concrete on the ground. These are waves of, of darkened light that sort of pass 
uh, in the space of a few seconds on the ground below us. And these are caused by fluctuations in the temperature of the air above us. It, it, regions of the atmosphere that have slightly different temperature bend the light um, in, in slightly different ways that produce these kind of shadow bands that we can see on the ground. Uh, these are like, it's, it's the same phenomena that makes stars twinkle when we look at them. Uh, but we can see this effect in the daytime uh, during the near near total phases, almost crescent, the crescent phases right before and right after totality here on the ground. They're easier to see on a light surface. So laying out a, a white bed sheet, for example, on the ground will optimize uh, your chances of seeing the shadow bands if you're in a region where we have uh, a crescent phase. Once totality begins, life gets even more exciting very quickly. Uh, we have these phenomena right at the at the moment of totality, Bailey's beads and the diamond ring effect. These are due to the fact that the surface of the moon is not smooth. There are craters and mountains. And so the eclipse doesn't happen exactly at the same uh, point everywhere on the moon. Where there's a low spot, we'll see a little bit of the sun uh, persisting uh, a bit longer than places that have high spots. And so we'll see these little, little uh, bright spots right at the moment uh, when the, the eclipse becomes totality. These are visible also as totality ends, uh, right at the end of totality. During totality, we should be able to see prominences and the red light of the sun's outer atmosphere, the sun's chromosphere. Uh, we're, this eclipse is occurring at a time when the sun is very active. And so we should see streamers coming out from the sun and beads of red uh, surrounding the moon uh, during totality. You can look and see how how far out from the sun you can see the corona. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment, and what it's what it's sort of distribution of light look. Is it rounded or or striky, strip, spiky? What does it actually look like? Here are a couple of pictures of the solar corona. One taken in 1995 when the sun was in a very inactive period, and one taken in June of 20 of 2001 when the sun was very active. This difference is due to what's called the sunspot cycle. The sun goes through an 11 year cycle of activity where we have more or fewer sunspots. When the sun is very active, we have lots of sunspots. We have lots of coronal activity. We have a very broad, beautiful, spread out uh, corona and lots of flaring activity on the sun. So we should be able to see much of that uh, during the Cummings uh, totality. The uh, sunspot cycle is monitored very carefully. And in uh, early 2024, mid 2025 or so, we will see uh, maximum totality. So right now we have lots of sunspots, lots of flares and prominence on the sun. So we should have a very beautiful and very colorful uh, eclipse experience this time. The other thing to look for in the sky during totality is the, is the planets, are the planets that we'll see in the sky. So all five of the classic naked eye planets will be in the sky uh, during totality. Jupiter will be very high above the sun uh, toward the south uh, uh, southeast. Uh, Mercury will be there, but it will be too faint to see. Uh, Venus will be quite bright. And Saturn and Mars will be below the sun toward the horizon. The reason we're able to see these planets is because of their location in their orbits during the day of totality. So here I have a chart of where the planets will be in their orbits around the sun on April 8th. The uh, four small circles in the middle of this diagram are uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And the sun is that little dot in the center. And we are the second out white circle, the, the, the third circle out. That's the location of the Earth just below where the, the S is for sun. So when we look toward the sun, you see that Mercury is almost in a line with the Earth. So we'll be looking at the side of Mercury that's facing away from the sun. That side is dark, and so it will be very not easy to see, not possible to see with the naked eye. We may be able to see a crescent Mercury with binoculars, so that would be something interesting to look at. You'll see that Jupiter is way off to the left there, so that's why it's so high in the sky above Jupiter. Venus is on the other side of the sun, so we're looking at, that's the yellow circle coming out from the sun, and so we're looking at the bright side of Venus, the side that is reflecting sunlight back to us, fairly close to the sun, and it will be very bright, and then Mars and Saturn further toward the horizon, not so bright, but still visible in the daylight sky uh, during totality when it's dark. Um, the other thing that's possible we'll see is a comet. This is the comet uh, Pons Brooks. Uh, we'll, we'll be reaching what we call perihelion. That's its closest point 
uh, in its orbit to the sun. It could be naked eye. Comets are very difficult to predict. Uh, it's that depends on how much outgassing and dust and, and ice particles that they eject as they approach the sun. But it's possible it will be visible naked eye and certainly will be visible with binoculars during totality. The comet has an orbital period of just over 70 years and it will be 150 million miles from Earth on the far side of the sun um, when, when uh, we have totality in April. This comet, uh, 12P Pons Brooks, has a connection to IU. Uh, this one was discovered in 1812, and a second comet was discovered in 1846 that may have been part of the same original body. In 1869, Daniel Kirkwood argued that their orbits are so similar, they were probably disturbed by Neptune and broken into, into separate comets. He looked at their orbits. They were not, they're not um, at the same angle. They're at different angles now. But he calculated back that in about 600 uh, BCE, uh, those two comet orbits would have been perfectly aligned. And so he, he argued that, in fact, they were uh, from the same parent body. So this wonderful comet that we might see really has a very strong IU connection with Daniel Kirkwood. If it's cloudy, uh, there are some other things you can do, right? Uh, it's a disappointment, but we can watch for uh, the eclipse coming from the Southwest, uh, watching the sky begin to get dark in the Southwest. Uh, it will get dark locally, and then watching the light come approach again from the Southwest and the darkness recede to the Northeast. We're likely to see temperatures in uh, changes in temperature, uh, changes in darkness, Appear these appearances on the on the horizon, and especially if it's cloudy, look for changes in animal behavior. Uh, chickens likely will go home to roost and then wake up a few minutes later to come out for breakfast. The roosters will crow. Uh, birds may roost or night night birds may uh, come out to forage. Uh, the deer may sort of start foraging as as it starts to get dark in the middle of the day. If you have a pet that might be uh, get worried about storms approaching, watch their behavior because they may be nervous as it gets dark at this unexpected time, thinking that it may be a uh, cloudy, uh, a storm approaching. So, so look after your pets. Uh, squirrels, watch them, see what they're going to do. Do the birds roost or do they get busy chirping? If you're in an area where the crickets are out, listen and see how, what they do as time gets, uh, as, as it gets dark. What are the bats doing? So there are a lot of things to watch for in nature, uh, if even if the cloudy if if it's cloudy during the eclipse, so here at IU we're planning some really exciting things for for the eclipse. The Hoosier Cosmic Celebration will take place at Memorial Stadium here at IU. Uh, our guests will be William Shatner of Star Trek fame, and Mae Jameson, the astronaut, and Janelle Monae, who will perform following the eclipse at, in the Memorial Stadium. Tickets are on sale. It should be a fabulous event, and we're looking forward to a wonderful. A huge crowd of visitors coming to Bloomington to enjoy this amazing event um, in April. Uh, I have to say it's a little bit scary from other perspectives. If we have clear weather, we could see upwards of 300,000 visitors to Bloomington. Uh, that would be fantastic, but a little scary if, if you think about public safety and traffic and food and bathrooms and all of those things. Uh, but we're really excited about the eclipse and really looking forward to sharing it with everyone. 300,000, just for reference, is about six football games all going on simultaneously. So you can imagine uh, what an event this is likely to be for Bloomington. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to see this, click on this uh, QR code. This is an app called Totality, very simple, one word, Totality. It's been produced by the American Astronomical Society and a company called Big Kids Science. And I urge everybody to pull out your cell phones and snap that QR code to uh, download this app to your phones. It shows, gives you a map and allows you to click wherever you happen to be on or wherever you're interested in being uh, during the eclipse to find out what will happen in your area. What time will the eclipse occur? Uh, how total or how partial will it be? How much of the sun will be covered? Exactly how long totality will last? This app is available both for iPhone and Android and it's free. So please, please, please grab a hold and, and have fun with this. It's a lot of fun just to see uh, what's going to happen where you are uh, during the eclipse uh, in a few weeks. IU Astronomy is preparing to live stream the eclipse from Kirkwood Observatory. 
we have two uh, very brave graduate students who will host our live stream talking about what's happening here in Bloomington, showing um, what's happening elsewhere in the country during the eclipse, interviewing people here on campus as we watch the eclipse, uh, showing live streams from various places that, that are things that are happening both here and elsewhere. So please tune in. Um, you can find it on our uh, campus, on our website for the astronomy department. Just click on uh, our outreach and education or uh, on the note that's on our, our homepage. We are training an army of graduate and undergraduate students to serve as interpreters for the campus and for our visitors during the event. We'll be participating in IU events at uh, Duns, Dun, Dun Meadow and at Duns and at the Arboretum uh, for students and, and for the community coming to join us. We're expecting a really exciting time and a wonderful time to share the excitement of, of this eclipse. You can follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter. We're at, at IU Astro. Um, and please, please join us. Um, there'll be announcements there about things happening before the eclipse and during the eclipse. And also take a look at our website for some of the other information that we have available for everyone. Um, I also want to particularly welcome those of you who are in the Monroe County area. There is coming up a talk by Dr. Phil Plate. He is well known as the bad astronomer. He has uh, had a, a blog and a column and a podcast for a long time about interesting aspects of astronomy, what's new, what's been happening in astronomy. He's a fabulous speaker. This talk will be on Wednesday, February 28th at about 6 p.m. in Wittenberger Auditorium at Indiana Memorial Union. It's sponsored by Union, uh, by Union Board and it's free to the public. I know this presentation is gonna be fantastic. He's a great speaker and we're really excited that he's coming to visit to our campus uh, to, to share his, his knowledge and experience with us. So please uh, join us if you can. Um, for Phil Plate's talk on uh, Wednesday, February 28th. That's just a week from now, and it should be a wonderful time. If you need more information about the eclipse, here are three websites I recommend. The uh, site eclipse.aas.org, that's eclipse.americanastronomicalsociety.org, uh, gives information about all things eclipse. They have information about eye safety, where to buy viewers from uh, a, a, a good, reliable vendors, uh, Eclipse uh, pictures and images from past eclipses that are royalty free that people can use, all kinds of information about eclipses, things that are happening around the country in different venues uh, for the eclipse. So it's a great place to get a lot of information. If you're going to be in the Monroe County area, visit bloomington.com slash eclipse has a complete uh, offer of local events of things happening around this area for, for the eclipse and a, a lot of information about visiting Bloomington, uh, what's available at, assistance in finding hotel rooms, places to stay, uh, kinds of events that, that are going on, what's going to be happening here. And that's a wonderful site. And of course, eclipse.iu.edu is a site for all things IU, what's happening on all of our campuses, what events are going on, and, and things that, that we can all come together to share. So that's all pretty exciting. I want to end with this particular slide, which basically says what I said before, standard warning, please, please, please don't look directly at the sun with your eyes during the partial phases. Be sure that you have uh, eclipse viewer or eclipse glasses or have an opportunity or a means to observe the eclipse during the partial phases indirectly. Uh, in one of those other examples that I showed earlier. Don't use binoculars or telescope to look at the sun unless you really know what you're doing and you have a special filter that's required to protect your eyes uh, uh, during or for solar viewing. Um, in 19, uh, 2017, there were some 48 cases of eye damage across the US from that eclipse. That's a remarkably low number. And we attribute it to the good communication between the ophthalmology and optometry communities and the astronomical community, but getting the word about out about eye safety. Um, you really don't wanna have permanent damage to your eyes. So please take care of your eyes. Don't look directly at the sun. So I will stop there and uh, welcome Tim Londrigan to join us. Um, and uh, take your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, yes, I'm happy to take, uh, let's see, I think we have a Q&A question here. I'll read it. This is from Mike Weaver. He starts by saying what I'd like to say. Thanks, Katie, for a wonderful talk. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could be at IU Bloomington for the eclipse, but I'm booked somewhere else, my Indiana hometown. As a dark sky advocate, I wonder how the university and the community government, businesses, residents, 
have responded when asked to be certain that outdoor lighting, and he lists a number of outdoor lighting examples, will not come on during the eclipse. As we know, such light pollution will reduce visibility of stars and the solar corona during totality and harm experiencing the awesomeness of a total solar eclipse. So, so what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> So I can say, I don't know about Monroe County. I don't know about the city of Bloomington, but I know here on this campus that they are already testing the lighting systems uh, to make sure that they will not go on during the eclipse. So um, their uh, campus is doing a fabulous job about understanding all of the issues related to the eclipse and what is uh, all the things that could go wrong and how to make sure things go right. So I'm very proud of all of the offices on this campus that have been working so hard for the last several months to think through all of these issues uh, and make sure that that we don't have the campus light pollution at least. So people on campus will not have a problem. I'm hopeful Monroe County and the city of Bloomington are doing the same thing, but I don't know for sure. Okay, uh, thank you. And, and by the way, uh, Katie is correct that the city of Bloomington uh, largely through the uh, offices of people in the astronomy department has has really uh, their awareness of the problems of light pollution has really increased dramatically in recent years. So this is something I think we can all be proud of. Mm -hmm. Patricia Brennan asks, again, can you tell us what are the chances of a clear cloudless afternoon in Bloomington on April 8th? <laughs> uh, historically, over the last 20 years, we've had 40% uh, on that date has had a clear sky. So 40% is where we stand. 60% is what we don't want. And that's one thing we have no control over. Uh, the map I showed that was color coded basically shows the higher probability of clear skies in uh, Southern Texas. Uh, but here we have to make do with what we get and we'll do our best. Uh, Ellen J asks, do you need additional eye protection if you use binoculars? So this may be an opportunity for you to stress what you need to do with binoculars. Yes. So during totality, you may use binoculars. Uh, but if you do, what I recommend is setting a timer so that you know when the sun is going to appear exactly and stop well before that point. Because uh, uh, just a sliver of the sun through binoculars into your eyes will cause significant eye damage. So I would recommend not using binoculars, looking, don't look at the moon, don't look at the region immediately around the sun. If you wish to use binoculars to look at the comet or Jupiter or the other planets, that's great uh, during totality. But any time during any, any partial phase before or after, absolutely no binoculars. It will, it is extremely dangerous for eyes. So Evelyn Shearer asks, um, where do you plan on watching the eclipse from? How many total eclipses have you seen in your own life? And what's your favorite aspect of solar eclipses? Oh, wow. Um, I have seen, this will be my third, assuming we have clear weather here in Bloomington. I saw the eclipse in 1979 on the Columbia River Gorge. It was a wonderful experience. In 2017, I was able to go down to Hopkinsville, Kentucky and see that eclipse, which was absolutely fabulous. Here, I'm going to be in Bloomington because my responsibilities are to assist all of our visitors and students and the community, our faculty, our staff, in having the best uh, experience they can have um, during this eclipse. So we, all of us in the department, will be helping out uh, during the eclipse, um, talking to people, sh sh showing them what they, what they can see, explaining what they're seeing during the eclipse, both in the partial phases and uh, during totality. So I will be here on campus. If I didn't have that responsibility, I would be in my backyard, staying home, off the road, not getting stuck in traffic, um, at a place where I have my refrigerator and my kitchen and uh, can pull out a comfortable chair and sit. So my backyard here in Bloomington would be my favorite place um, if I weren't actually here on campus. But I do expect to be on campus and, and just trying to make sure everybody has the best experience possible. Yes, I just want to second that. Um, as Katie mentioned, uh, we're going to have up to 300,000 people in Bloomington. Um, 
and almost 100% of them will be wanting to move uh, more or less immediately after the eclipse. Um, so if you're planning to go out for a meal at a restaurant in Bloomington after the eclipse, uh, you should probably cancel that immediately. Um, Mike Wiesner uh, points out that I mispronounced his name. I called him Mike Weaver, so my apologies. Ted Brown says, uh, if there was no moon, there would be no solar eclipse. So what is the timeline for Earth's formation and the moon's formation? Uh, we know the moon formed relatively early on after the Earth formed. We believe it formed from a collision of a protoplanetary body with the Earth that knocked, uh, shattered that particular body and knocked a chunk of the Earth's crust uh, out into space um, and that formed a, a ring of gas and dust around the Earth that finally coalesced into the moon. Something like four or four plus a, a few billion, four billion plus a bit uh, years ago, so very early on. At that time, the moon was closer to the Earth, and if there had been people around to watch an eclipse, they would have seen a much larger appearance of the moon, same physical size, but closer, so it looked much bigger, and seen many more eclipses and much larger eclipses than we would see today. We know now that the moon is moving away from the Earth at about a centimeter per year, and that uh, happens because the en the moon is losing energy as through the tides on the Earth as it orbits around. It kind of stretches the Earth, pulls energy from the moon's orbit, slows down the um, Earth's rotation, and moves the moon a little bit further out. So as that happens over the next uh, hundreds of thousands of years, the moon will eventually become far enough away that we will not see total eclipses of the moon any longer. So this is a good time to be watching. If we're hanging around for, you know, several hundred thousand years, we won't have the opportunity to see the eclipses that we can see today. We have a question from Tennis Foltz, who asks, could you please show the PowerPoint slide again for the approximate times of the eclipse? Yes, I can just tell you. So here in Bloomington, the partial eclipse will begin about uh, 149. Totality begins at 304 50, 51, so four minutes and 51 seconds after three o'clock. The midpoint of totality is at 306 52. Totality ends at 308 53. And partial eclipse ends at about 423, 422, 422 28. But that time varies with every location uh, during the eclipse. So you really want to get that totality app which will tell you exactly when that will happen at your location. Okay, Lacey Casso asks, have any major historical events happened during total eclipses that we know of? Uh, one of my personal favorites is the story of um, Tecumseh and, and William Henry Harrison. So back when settlers were moving into Indiana, into the Indiana Territory, Tecumseh tried to organize the tribes to provide better resistance to the incursion of settlers into, into Native American lands. And he, in order to help sort of pull the tribes in and, and to uh, create a unified group under his leadership, he announced that uh, having been a very well educated, he and his brother both, his brother was a prophet, uh, they announced that there would be a total eclipse of the sun on a particular day um, and that would sort of demonstrate his leadership. William Henry Harrison said that was nuts. He said, there's no way that's going to happen. It just shows how crazy these Native Americans are. But Tecumseh was right. And that really enabled him to unify the tribes in the Indiana Territory and to really put up a much um, better resistance to not, not ultimately successful, but nonetheless a better resistance. We have a series of talks coming uh, during Science Fest, if you happen to be in Bloomington that are being organized by the humanities departments and history departments here on campus to uh, talk about all the different things that have occurred or been caused by eclipses in human history, going back to ancient times and through more recent times. So eclipses have played a really important role in human history all along the, all along the, the way. And if you happen to be here and can come to Science Fest on Saturday, April 6th, 
feel free to come and enjoy these talks by, by our humanities departments. They have done a fabulous job. Yes. So here's a question from John Wolfram. Uh, will IU have on-site activities on April 8th at the Kirkwood Observatory or the Meadow for in-person eclipse viewing by IU alumni and friends? We watched the 2017 eclipse at the Hopkinsville Community College and it was fantastic. <laughs> it is fantastic. And yes, we will have uh, viewing devices, telescopes, um, everything you need to watch the eclipse, both at the Arboretum and at Dunn Meadow. And I believe even we'll have some telescopes up by the by Memorial Stadium. I think there are a number of other sites planning around town uh, that will have telescopes available as well. At Kirkwood, we are a very small building and we don't have a lot of room to open the observatory for visitors. That's why we're producing the online uh, streaming video for um, for the eclipse. Um, some realities have to, have to, we have to think about some realities here. During a football game, IU is able to, to bring in off-duty police from uh, communities around to help with all of the tra traffic and public safety that we need when we have large crowds in Bloomington. But during the eclipse, we can't do that. And so our, our public safety officers are stretched pretty thin and they're trying to make sure that we have just a limited number of venues of activity uh, during the eclipse so that we can ensure public safety. And because the Kirkwood is such a small place, we really can't host a large crowd there. So we're encouraging people to visit Dun Meadow and the Arboretum uh, to join us there where we will be uh, tabling and uh, talking about all the things that were that are going on during the eclipse. Tricia Stumpf asks, um, when watching solar eclipses, which phase is your favorite? <laughs> Totality. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. I'm looking forward to seeing the corona and looking at the flares that surround the moon, um, seeing those structures. I'm really, really excited about the possibility of seeing the comet. And I'm just hoping it's bright enough that we can all see it and that it's clear that it's not cloudy. Yes. Uh, Susan Johnson asks, during totality, will there be enough light coming through my Seymour solar filter to take well-exposed pictures? Yes. Uh, during totality, you don't need a solar filter. So during totality, take it off. You can take pictures of the corona surrounding the uh, moon, surrounding the sun. Uh, you'll need probably a, a you want to take a number of pictures with different exposure times, uh, but you do not need a filter during totality. Uh, anytime it's not totality, we recommend putting that filter on your camera uh, because uh, a sustained pointing of that camera at the sun could damage the photo sensors in the camera. Uh, so during totality, don't need the filter, but outside of totality, you definitely do. Uh, I could add there's a um, an app available called Solar Snap that will will help you manage your phone if if you're using your cell phone to take pictures help manage the exposure times uh, during totality take a sequence of of exposures um, during partial phases and during totality um, so I recommend that app and uh, just a normal solar viewer um, I thought I had one here somewhere but just one of those taped over your camera or phone is sufficient during partial phases. And Patricia Brennan says, I remember the small planetarium. Are there any plans to create a larger one? <laughs> Wouldn't that be lovely? We don't have a planetarium here in Bloomington, which is, is very sad. Uh, we don't have plans. Um, I'd be, be delighted to hear from any of you who would like to donate the millions of dollars it would take to build one. Uh, but we don't have one here in Bloomington. And I think collaborating, for example, with Wonder Lab here in Bloomington would be a wonderful way to uh, create that that wonderful, lovely um, ability here in Bloomington to for kids, for the schools, for campus, all the different ways to be able to help people learn more about the night sky. I wish we did, but we don't. Okay, that does it for all of the questions at the moment. So let me make a, a comment here. Uh, if you uh, are not in Monroe County, but live in Indiana, I would like to recommend that the uh, our IU Center for Rural Engagement has actually got a, um, well, I can't focus it here. <laughs> They've got a pamphlet called uh, 2024 Total Solar Eclipse Planning Toolkit. 
and I recommend it highly. It's got a number of suggestions and comments, and it also has a number of references you can look at for uh, apps or things on the web. Let me let me ask uh, Katie. Um, let's assume that it's really cloudy on April eighth. Alas, um, you will have, I assume, live live streaming of locations where it actually is sunny and you see the full solar eclipse. Yes, we will. So the it takes about an hour for the eclipse to travel, the totality to travel from Texas up through Maine. So we'll be following that in. Uh, from Texas on up as, as we find uh, sites that will be live streaming from those locations, we'll show those first. And then when the totality comes to Bloomington, we'll show, we'll intersperse with views from Kirkwood all along, of course, but in totality, with totality in Bloomington, we'll show what we see here. And then we'll continue to show uh, activity going forward um, as the eclipse passes us and moves up, up into uh, the Northeast and, and through Maine. So there'll be a, full, basically three hour show uh, with all the all the different live feeds that we can find uh, during during that period. Uh, Katie, you mentioned that uh, you know, some of the IU scientists in 1869 who observed uh, uh, an eclipse here, um, they were actually um, very active in looking at eclipses. They traveled long distances, I think, and I'm told that they would travel on boats with 60 foot cameras that they had to lug to uh, sites where they could take photos of an eclipse. It sounds really uh, uh, adventurous and it, difficult. Yeah, terrifying and scary. Uh, <laughs> the optics available in the 19th century it involved lenses and th that needed very long focal lengths. And so they didn't have much option but to have these just crazy things. Nowadays, we have much better optics, much better ability to build small telescopes that give us absolutely great views. But it was a, a real challenge in the 19th century to be an eclipse chaser. Uh, travel was difficult. They were long distances to go. The equipment was difficult to, to transport and set up. Um, just, just very difficult. Um, at the same time, those eclipse chasers did really important things because that was the only way that they could study during an eclipse, the only way that they could study the outer atmosphere of the sun. And so those photographs taken in the 19th century have been invaluable as we learn more and more about the history of the sun it's, and how it, it changes uh, during different solar cycles. So those pioneering efforts are incredibly important to the history of our, of our knowledge of the sun. Uh, oh, Jill Weber asked, how again do we get the pamphlet you mentioned? This is the uh, IU Center for Rural Engagement. Um, so it's on their website. If you, uh, I don't remember what their website is just off the top of my head, but if you, if you Google IU Center for Rural Engagement Eclipse, just those words, uh, it will pop up and you'll be able to download it. And it's, it's got great information for any community along the path of totality or outside the path of totality. Uh, uh, communities outside the path will be uh, experiencing similar difficulties after totality as everybody leaves totality and heads out into those outer regions. Uh, they are going to experience every bit of the traffic difficulties that we will have here in Bloomington as well. So those communities are also encouraged to get this information and begin to prepare for what that's going to mean uh, on Eclipse Day for, for them. Uh, I have a question from Josh Lodolo. Um, actually, a very interesting one. Is there a connection between total solar eclipses and interest among students in studying astronomy? <laughs> you know, it, it's an interesting thing. Uh, big events in our society tend to be things that motivate students. So uh, the uh, pandemic, for example, caused a great interest in studying public health among students. And uh, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope encourages students to get more interested in astronomy. All of these things sort of lead kids, students, to explore areas that they hadn't thought about that when they've become important in their lives. And I think many astronomers uh, found that eclipses were one of the ways that they really got engaged in trying to understand 
what's beyond the earth, what's out there, how does it affect us, and and how do we understand its origins and and evolution? So I, yes, I believe that will likely happen. Uh, I should, by the way, as with regard to the question about whether students get more interested in astronomy during a solar eclipse, perhaps I should mention that I personally uh, was 14 years old uh, when Russia um, launched the Sputnik uh, satellite. Uh, it was a tremendous shock to Americans to see that the Russians were actually ahead of us at this point, and we desperately needed scientists and engineers. And that actually uh, probably was uh, one of the things that made me go into science was this apparent need for patriotic Americans to uh, become scientists or engineers. Okay, uh, Sean Yancey asks, have there ever been any images taken of a solar eclipse from space showing the moon's shadow on earth? Yes, there are such images. And we've got images of Jupiter, for example, uh, with eclipses on Jupiter from its own moons. You could watch the shadow sort of cross oh, wow. the disk of Jupiter. So eclipses happen on other planets around, uh, well, the big ones that have big moons out there. Uh, Mars's, Mars's satellites are too tiny to produce eclipses on the surface of Mars, but Saturn and, and Jupiter and, and Uranus, and I think also Neptune, have moons that are sufficiently large uh, to produce uh, eclipses on those those big planets. Pluto's moon, I believe, also can can um, can produce eclipses on Pluto, although we have no images of that. Fascinating. Uh, Tennis Fultz asks, how far in advance would you recommend traveling from Northwest Indiana to Indy or IU Bloomington? And how long should I stay afterwards uh, so the traffic is likely not to be so miserable? Yeah. So what we found in Kentucky from those of us who went south there to see the eclipse was that getting there was relatively easy. We arrived a um, couple hours, two, maybe two, three hours before the eclipse. Uh, and the traffic was smooth the whole way. Getting back took from Hopkinsville to Evansville took about six hours, maybe seven hours. So it was a really long time. Um, I think I would anticipate that the traffic will stay backed up for at least five hours, maybe longer following totality. And just because if you if it there will be this this bolus of traffic that leaves right after the eclipse, if you wait an hour and then leave, you're going to run into that traffic. So the best thing is just to find a place to spend the night and leave the next day. Um, if you are traveling into the eclipse, I I recommend because it's April. I recommend bringing uh, flashlights, extra batteries. If you have medications that you're going to need, be sure you have those with you. Um, uh, and just be prepared, bring snacks, food, water, be prepared to uh, end up in traffic at some point. Um, after midnight might be better, uh, but it will be it will be difficult. Uh, I think this may be the, the last question because we I, I my guess is that we're running into time constraints here. Um, Ellen J says, I read that Delta is going to offer a flight to follow the path of totality. Do you know anything about this? Um, this is that happens typically during eclipses that there are um, airplanes that try to catch up. Uh, the eclipse moves at a thousand miles an hour, roughly, plus or minus about a thousand miles an hour, and that means that the jet plane can't keep up with the eclipse. So uh, passengers will get uh, an, a longer view of the eclipse, but not that much longer than they're going to get on the ground because the plane just can't keep up with how fast the eclipse moves across the countryside. Great, thank you again for joining us and participating in this evening's live stream. I would like to personally thank Professors Pelachowski and Lundergan for their time and expertise. We are grateful to you all. Finally, I should acknowledge that events like this would not be possible without the support of donors who understand the value of a liberal arts education. If you would like to support programs like tonight's presentation or other opportunities that connect alumni and friends with the College of Arts and Sciences or Indiana University, please consider making a contribution to the IU Bloomington College Alumni Engagement Fund at the Indiana University Foundation. We hope to see you next time. Until then, take care.